Five years ago, the UX team at Sequoia Escapes consisted out of two web designers. What that means was they were responsible for any designs and any front-end development. They were, so to speak, the check of all trades, the master of none. For creating user interfaces, they mostly used Photoshop. They didn't have any process in place, didn't do planning, no researching, and they basically worked on a day-to-day -day basis. Then Sequoia Escapes hired a young and ambitious person called Ian. And Ian had a vision, and he knew that he had to change the business in order to create a product that fulfills the user's needs and desires. He introduced the human-centered design process. It started to discover problems, define hypotheses, and started to talk with actual users to gain insights. And these insights then influenced the design decisions. Despite these massive changes, we still weren't happy. We felt like there was something missing. So we started to research and try to find a way how we can mature even more our UX process. And we came across the UX maturity model. This model assumes that an organization goes through eight stages in order to evolve and mature their UX process. According to the Norman Nielsen group, sorry, Nielsen Norman group, <laughs> it takes a company around 40 years to move from stage one to stage eight. And when we started our journey five years ago, we assessed our UX maturity level. And we found out that we were on stage two. And what that means is we had a developer-centered user experience. We relied on our own intuition, what is good and what is bad usability. But we didn't back that up by any communication with the user. You almost could compare it to a diver deep down in the ocean. It's quite cold, lonely, and painful. It doesn't sound like a great situation, right? I don't want to pretend like I know everything about UX strategy or business thinking, because there are far too many experienced people out in the community who can tell you more about this. But I want to tell you a few initiatives that we started, that you all can start, to mature UX practice. The first initiative that two of our interaction designers, Desi and Raquel, started was implementing the hard framework. The framework is designed by Google and it's a set of user-centric metrics and it aims to measure the user experience. It consists of five factors, happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, and task success. Here at Secret Escapes, we focused on two of them, happiness and task success. And the reason why we focused on two of them was because we wanted to prove the value in a quick way. So for this reason, we started to measure, for example, user satisfaction, likelihood to recommend, and efficiency and effectiveness on certain tasks. And based on these results, we then for example, improved our booking form, the content creation process, and also came up with a new search and filters tool. This framework showed us that we can be confident in the work and the impact it has on our customers. We are now proactive in, instead of reactive because we know what is going on and we can respond accordingly. However, this success was also shadowed by a few challenges that we were facing. For example, when we were implementing this framework, there was almost none to very little information on how to do that. Essentially, we figured it out and we tailored our research methodologies to our needs. And then, when we came to conducting user tests, we saw a small but important detail. We could also call it a problem. We saw that People who usually attend those user sessions, they tend to think out loud. And the reason why they do that is because we designers have been telling them for many years. 
So, for example, tell me what do you think, what do you not understand this wireframe, this website, this solution? So if we have been telling them for many years, why is it suddenly a problem? Well, for task success, a key metric is to measure how long it takes a user to complete a certain task. And if they are talking, well, obviously, it takes them longer to complete that task. So my advice, understand the framework, write down any goals and behaviors you want to measure, and then understand and speak to people who can help you understand what metrics are already available, what you can collect, what you can utilize, and then action the framework and analyze the results. The second initiative that our visual design lead Quentin started was implementing a design language system. A design language system is a collection of usable components such as buttons, forms, typography, you name it, everything is in there. And these components are, designed, are defined under a certain standard and they have a meaning. And when you put them together, you can create a consistent omni-channel product experience. So how did we implement this here at Secret Escapes? Well, we started by taking all the elements from our website. We basically pulled the interface apart. And I can tell you, it was a big mess. We had seven different button styles. We had four different stylings for input fields and tool tips. And we, on top of that, used multiple fonts. It was just pure chaos. But we didn't let ourselves become demotivated. Based on our inventory, we started to create a basic style guide, which we then formed into a library, our design language system. It, for example, includes our brand colors and images that represent those colors. It includes our typography and, for example, our button styles. It sounds like a pretty straightforward process. I can tell you we've come a long way with many ups and downs. The first challenge that we were facing was time. Our initiative started up as a side project. There was very little time allocated to it and eventually ended up being abandoned for nine months until finally Quentin started to work on it eight hours a week. And now when he became the visual design lead, he works full time with it. The second challenge that we were facing was getting stakeholder buy-in. It is not that easy to convince business owners that you have to fundamentally change the way you create and design a product, especially if it already makes money. But how we got the buy-in was that we linked it to an already ongoing project. Stakeholders were really excited about this project and we used that spark to transfer it onto our initiative. The third challenge that we were facing was adoption. People sometimes get really attached to visual elements and it's difficult to make them see and accept the benefits of a new design language. But by involving them directly from the start, right from the beginning of the process, you make them feel valuable, like their opinion counts, and that makes them easier to be open to the changes. As the third initiative, I founded the Interaction Design Community of Practice. A community of practice is a group of people who share the same concerns and passions for the same topic. And the reason why I founded the community was because we noticed significant knowledge gaps across the whole company in recognizing our users' needs towards our product. For us designers, it is in our highest interest to create a good user experience and have an impact for the business at the same time. However, this wasn't possible with these knowledge gaps. So we set ourselves a mission within the community to spread the importance and value of a good user experience. We started to gather all our research methodologies to create templates to share all our learnings. 
and then we put it up on our newly created design website. Our colleagues finally were able to find out information about us, the community, the design team, the human-centered design process, and any learnings that we had so far. Additionally, we also held an interactive session with the marketing department. We brought UX process closer to people working outside of the product development cycle. Our colleagues had to generate and sketch out their ideas to see how focused and concentrated they are. The room was completely silent. It was a magical moment. And then, and then they had to validate their ideas. They had to give each other feedback on their sketches. And you can't imagine how surprised they were when they noticed how difficult it is to draw what you have in your mind. This session made them appreciate how much work we put into our solutions. So my advice to keep people engaged into the community, meet regularly so you keep them committed physically to the meetup. Have clear deadlines and responsibilities distributed over all the members so you can hold them accountable for their commitments. And last but not least, have fun to increase trust and to reduce the fear of conflict between the members. Five years ago, after Ian had his vision, I can proudly say that Secret Escapes increased its UX maturity level from two to five. Managed usability. User experience finally made it into this company. We have an official UX group consisting of dedicated user researchers, interaction designers, visual designers, and front-end developers. And this group is led by a UX manager, Ian, the, uh, the guy who had a vision five years ago. Before I round off this talk, I want to bring you back to the diver I mentioned in the beginning. As a diver, there's one important rule. You have to move slowly towards the surface meter by meter. Otherwise, your blood will start boiling and you will become sick. And just like the diver, you have to progress step by step. You can't change the UX maturity level in one go. You need to change it from one stage to another. And if we do that, we can do some pretty amazing things. For me, that's creating a better user experience. For you, that could mean something else, something powerful. Our challenge is it to wake up each day and ask yourself, what can I do to make the company move? And if we do that, just maybe, we don't have to create, we don't have to use Photoshop anymore for creating user interfaces. Thank you very much.